Okay, our keynote speaker tonight is Hari Pulapaka, and I know he's here because I saw him earlier. And I invite you down to the podium or up or wherever you want. Here you are. Um, this is an interesting guy. Uh, I watched your TED talk, right, which was fascinating. Um, this is a PhD mathematician who has become uh, James Beard, what do they call you? A James Beard nominated chef. So a very talented man who was brought to us by our, another one of our very talented board members, Rella Abernathy from, why don't you stand up, Rella? <laughs> from Boulder. <laughs> so there's a connection here. That's really nice. And um, so Harry, Hari started the um, rest a restaurant in Deland, Florida, which is about 30 minutes from Orlando, I guess. Um, and he is a part of a group of chefs nationwide that is having incredible influence uh, in policy circles because these are chefs that are really demanding sustainable food, food that is grown sustainable. And so when we talk about field to table, it's always questionable where the change begins. Does it begin in the field or does it begin at the table? And I think it's a synergy of consumers and chefs really creating demand for sustainably produced food. Um, I, I got involved in a debate um, on aquaculture, um, on sort of organic policy, and came across another chef who works at Stone Barns in New York. You may have heard of this. Um, do you know the guy? John Barber. Yeah, yeah John Barber. So John, um, Dan, Dan, Barber. Dan Barber. Dan uh, has this great YouTube video. You should watch Hari's as well as Dan's, uh, called The Love Affair of the Fish. And he talks about, as a, as a chef, the, how, how meaningful it is to you know, prepare a dish that not only tastes good, but is grown in an environment that is respectful of the ecosystem. And he actually went to Spain and found sustainable, agri sustainable aquaculture uh, and describes the difference just in the taste. So what, what we're now ending this session on is why taste matters, not only for the experience of it, but based on where it comes from and how it's grown. So with that, I turn the podium over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I have some props that I have to <laughs> take a moment to look at. I'm, so, I'm glad this is not beyond plastics, because I'd be in big trouble if it was. <laughs> I have the farmer to blame for this kind of packaging, I have to tell you. Don't blame the farmer. We're not blaming the farmer. I'm blaming this farmer. <laughs> okay. Thank you again for bearing with that nonsense. But <laughs> Um, so very briefly, just thank you all for having me here. I'm not quite sure if I truly belong in your expertise amongst all this expertise in pesticides and, and being beyond pesticides. Uh, I'm definitely not trained at all in that kind of science. I torture my students in classrooms with mathematics written all over the board, and, and in the restaurant I hope to make up for that by trying to cook delicious food. That's the life I live uh, with my beautiful wife, Dr. Jennifer Pulpa. If there's any physician, and if there's any doctor here between the two of us, it's her. Uh, she knows a lot more about medicine and food uh, and the body than I ever will. But thank you for thinking that my, uh, my opinions on some of this has some value. And thank you, Rella, for making this happen. So as a brief outline, I just wanted to, I think there's been a lot of intersection already from what I've heard, but what I, what I might be touching on. Uh, but Hopefully, my perspective is one that's a little more unique, and it, it, I, am, I am in the field, not literally, but figuratively, uh, in that I take what comes from the field, and I try to, try to make it as good as it can be for human consumption, uh, beyond it being raw. So that is my role as a chef, and so, uh, but be, before all that happened, I'm an academic first, so I, I think about food very academically, believe it or not. And my hope in the future is that more and more chefs think about food very academically. And I think that has a great potential for systemic change in, in the kinds of things we can demand in the marketplace. 
So very briefly, you know, the food industry as I see it, you know, producers, chefs, consumers, and consumers really are the ones that are going to get the bullet points because we are the people, right? We are what we eat and we are the ones who will dictate the marketplace. Whether you live in a capitalist environment or other kind of environment, ultimately it's about demand. I mean, I teach this in the mathematics class. It's about demand. You can't control the price. You react to the demand, then you dictate the price. You, and you offer a price, and if the demand's not there, you've got to do something about it. So uh, it starts with demand and having a sense of what that demand is. So, and then ultimately perspectives from my field, i.e. the restaurant. Uh, and then what I think we can do collectively as consumers first, and then as practitioners and specialists next. And then ultimately, you know, where there's food, hopefully there's some thoughts, there's some food for thought, and then I'll open the field up for any questions you may have. I think the food industry is, is, is dictated today because of any number of reasons, but the most important reason, the most important factor that dictates how the food industry operates is essentially the consumer's voracious appetites for what they demand, right? So when we are conveniently, when we want convenience, we demand that. And when there's the, the demand, those businesses flourish. We can't fault the enterprise of business for that. Somehow we're demanding that. We're all in at this together, right? So we love to eat non-seasonally, obviously. We want asparagus year-round. We love grilled asparagus. It's delicious. What's there not to love? <laughs> but where is this going to come from, where you live? So if we demand that, it's going to be in the grocery store. And it's not going to be produced the way you'd like it to be produced. It's just the way it is. Uh, it's going to be laden with preservatives. You know, uh, uh, we don't even know if what we read makes sense. We'll never understand half of the things in the food labeling. Uh, I'll get to this display in just a moment. Right? So labor conditions obviously affect the food industry. Uh, growing conditions, this is what this forum is basically all about and, and it specializes about the pesticide issue, the fertilizer issue, the antibiotic issue. It's a, it's a component in the food industry. The food industry is a much larger enterprise. It uses all of these things and misuses a lot of these things, obviously. Um, of course, animal welfare, you know, uh, and then sustainability, which is a, a word that's thrown around far too easily, if you ask me. And it's thrown around too callously in academic circles, even. The word sustainable means very different things to many people. Uh, you can break it down to a very minimalistic level and say sustainability is about preserving what's now that's good for future generations as best as we can. But that has to be measured. I mean, I mean what does that mean? What does it mean to say that you've deemed something sustainable? How have you come to that conclusion? What does that mean? What is the measurement, right? Uh, producers, well, this is, I just, I just got this today from the USDA website. A farm is any place from which $1,000 or more of basically produce can be sold or produced in a year. I didn't know that. That's the USDA's definition of a farm. And so you've got farms of all kinds, large and small. Factory farms, that phrase has been used, small farms, obviously. Apparently more over 2 million farms in the United States. And most recently, we've learned that more and more farms are being certified organic, and that's a good thing. We can all agree. Uh, but it's still only about 1% of the whole number. Please correct me if I'm wrong. It's, these are numbers that I got from the USDA website. Right? Um, this is a big thing for me, terroir. Right? It's a very fancy term. It always refers to, it always is used in the context of wine and winemaking, and especially French winemaking. But I think the terroir of food has lost its place and meaning. To, to eat food that tastes like where you come from or where you live is losing its meaning. Only because the world is a much smaller place and especially because we eat unseasonably. unseasonably. We demand things on a dime and then it has to come from somewhere and often it's not from where you live. So your food is, does not taste like where you live anymore. The only chance you have of, that, of making that happen is if you grow it yourself. And chances are that it'll be only vegetables. 
And I'm not sure how many in this room are vegetarians. I was a vegetarian for the first 21 years of my life. My wife has been a vegetarian for about 21 years of her life. I'm not sure how many in this room are vegetarians. Certainly the dinner tonight was vegetarian. That was a nice surprise. Uh, Rella is vegetarian. I know that. <laughs> but unless you're a vegetarian, it's hard to grow all of your own food. It really is. I mean, you can have chickens, and you can have a, a, a pig, and you can do some of that stuff. But the average person in this world cannot grow their own food if they're not vegetarian. That's a fact. That's a, that's a hard reality. That's just a fact. Um, Marty spoke to the decrease in the number of acreage of organic farms. Uh, on the other hand, you get news about how the number of organic farms have grown, has gone up. So which, what's better, the greater number of farms or smaller acreage? It's a question that needs to be asked. Where do we revel in that success? Right? What's a, what's a measure of success? So in the tradition of playing video clips during this panel, <laughs> I have a very brief one. Uh, in our region, we have two or three farms that I've been sourcing for them from uh, voraciously, to use that same word again, since the day we opened our restaurant about seven years ago. And the Barefoot Farmer is the nickname of Bill Thomason, a fourth generation farmer in Samsula, Florida. His farm is not organic. He claims it's as, as close to organic as it can get. And I'm going to guess that means he uses some things that are not organic. Uh, but he knows, he, he believes he's doing the right thing. He's a fourth generation farmer. He's doing the best he can. He's supporting his family. His son is into the business now. So this semester, my students at Stetson University did a whole project, my honor students, on trying to understand our little local food system. So they went to the farmer's market of the Volusia County far Fairgrounds, and they talked to Bill Thomason. And here's a little bit from Bill. Sustainable, able to be maintained at a certain rate or level. Dr. Pulpaka's class was challenged to discover what it meant to eat sustainably. First, we head to the farmer's market. And while my parents farmed, and I drove my first tractor when I was five years old. So I've, I've been farming full time since 1977. Yeah, like in recent years, there being more the amount of people at farmers markets increasing, or is it kind of steady throughout? Uh, some markets are busy, or some are slower. Yeah. But overall, people are trying to get fresh produce, but, yeah. but then everybody tells them it's all fresh, and, and they just buy it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Very little fresh produce. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And do you have like any advice for college students at shopping on a budget or any you know way for, to encourage them to look, uh, utilize local resources? Or? Well, I can tell you this. You get what you pay for. That's it. That's all I want you to get from that. <laughs> you get what you pay for. You get what you pay for is what Bill Thomason believes. I suspect a lot of farmers believe that. You get what you pay for. Okay, let's come back to that question. Do you or not? We'll see. So my role here, I feel, I feel is, uh, is to give you some insight on the kinds of work that I've gotten myself into in the past couple of years when it comes to advocacy related to trying to improve small aspects of our local food systems as a chef, as a professional chef, one who handles the produce that comes from the farm and then tries to ultimately tell his or her guests where this comes from, how it was grown, why it's better for you than getting that big truck that pulls up in front of your restaurant and dumps off lots of stuff that may not be good for you, right? There's, some, there's an array of that here. There's some of that here on this table. Uh, clearly, this is not something that's recent. The Chefs Collaborative has been around for some time. It's a wonderful network of chefs around this country uh, who have been doing just that for several decades now. More recently, the Chef Action Network, I'm fortunate to be a part of that. Uh, it's been blessed by the James Beard Foundation, but that aside, it's a growing network of chefs, like-minded chefs, who truly are getting sick and tired of, of the restaurant marketplace being flooded, flooded by really crappy ingredients, ultimately. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to say, okay, look, we're, we're forgetting to cook. Some of us are just forgetting to cook. And so we, we don't think cooking real food is important anymore. So maybe we need to go out there and share our 
our passion for this. You don't have to be a chef to cook real food. We all know that, right? So what we believe ultimately is to try to celebrate where we come from, to showcase the ingredients that give us what we're able to do well, and to ultimately teach and, and, and empower those around us to be able to do those things at home as frequently as they can, to support the local enterprises where they are as frequently as they can. It sounds counterintuitive to our business as being a restaurant. Why wouldn't you want people to come to your restaurant more frequently rather than cook at home more frequently? But it's a win-win situation. They can then understand why your food tastes good and they can appreciate when you use real ingredients. It makes, they know the difference because they've done this at home. And that's the point. It's otherwise it's just lip service. To say that something tastes, just, tastes better because the ingredient's better is just lip service if you can't taste the difference. So the more you can cook at home and the more you go back to basics, I think it'll be more real. And that's worldwide. That's, there are no boundaries for that kind of living. There are absolutely no boundaries. So why should chefs care, right? Uh, you can clearly take a very high road opinion about this. Chefs should care because it's the right thing to do. That's not good enough. That argument's been used in any number of circles. It's unfortunately not good enough. The right thing to do already is up for debate. What is right and what is wrong? What is right? What is correct and what is wrong? I've always wondered about that, right and wrong versus correct and wrong. Shouldn't it be right and left and correct and wrong? But so, correct and wrong. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a math teacher, so either something is either correct or it's wrong. <laughs> uh, but the correct thing to do, why should that be what it is, right? That, that's up for debate. Um, but why, why should chef care? Chef should care well beyond the fact that it's the correct thing to do. They should care for very, for very altruistic and material reasons. The food just tastes better. Bottom line, the food tastes better when you use good ingredients. So how could anybody, any real chef argue with that? That's an easy sell for me. That's a real easy sell for me. When I can taste food that reminds you of your terroir, you're going to feel comfort when you eat that food. You're going to enjoy that food. That's an easy sell for me. When I support my local economy that brings it back to my restaurant and they support me back in turn, that's an easy sell for me. I'm a more profitable business for that reason. So you can take the whole it's good for you and correct for your side and put very mundane material reasons and it's still all good for you. So chefs should, should, should care for that reason, for those reasons, clearly. And I've, I've, I've bought into it years ago. So I care passionately about these things because I see beyond the big picture. I see beyond the, the, the value system of it being the correct thing to do. I get it and I've been successful, I think, because of that. Is our guests truly trust us. They trust Jennifer and I when we say, hey, this stuff comes from here, it's good for you for this reason. And they, they frequent us passionately for that reason. And that, those are easy sells. Those are easy sells. Pride in ingredients, as I just mentioned. Taste the difference, economic value. Right? Well beyond it's the correct thing to do. Why do consumers demand the wrong things? I'm passing judgment here. Why do, we put, why do we demand the wrong things? Well, obviously convenience. And the fast food market has been flourishing because of the convenience aspect. It's much easier to sit in your car or vehicle and get a bite of food than to step out, go to a reasonable grocery store, prepare a meal, and eat that meal. The time difference is, is immense. We live in a fast-paced world. We don't have the time to do any of that. Maybe once or twice a week if we're lucky will manage the time to find real ingredients and cook real food. We're always on the go. We frequent restaurants. It's easier to do that. So then because we frequent restaurants, and if we have values about trying to put the right things in our body, we try to, we try to frequent restaurants that do the right thing. And we feel good about that. If we go to a restaurant that does the right thing, we're doing something OK. But I tell you it's better to cook it yourself. And I'm saying to you as a chef with a restaurant, I recommend you buy real ingredients and cook, cook at home more frequently. That's the best thing you can do. Let's not forget how to cook. Let's not forget how to make meals be the center place of storytelling and bringing families together 
and talking about the farmer who provided those ingredients for you. We've gotten away from that. I may be preaching to the choir here, because I think you're there. You're a different mindset. But if this was a different arena, I would be, I think there would be an audience there. I think you're all probably already doing that, I get the feeling. If you're not, you should be. <laughs> <laughs> Access to food, right? This is a big problem. Access to good food is a clear issue. We all know the stereotypes about having crappy convenience stores in, in, in economically uh, distressed areas of cities and towns versus having better ingredients and more profitable and more upscale and more uh, uh, well-off uh, areas of town. That's clearly the market. I mean, the reason those things happen is because this populace will pay so much for this and this populace will pay so much for that. So how do we change that? That's clearly a market economy that's working. That's, that, that's the bad side of the market economy showing its face. How do we change that? You can't just say it needs to change. You have to offer real solutions. You have to have, you have, to have reasons why this should move here and this should move here and there should be a middle that's reasonable for everybody. Right? They're not, you don't want exchange at all. You want this to go away and this doesn't need to be up here. We need a middle that's good for most. Then you have systemic change. Ultimately, flavor. Right? So fast food, laden with all of its preservatives and high sodium and high sugar values, tastes really good. You don't feel very good after you eat it, but it tastes very good. So it's inexpensive, it's convenient, and it tastes good. It's genius. And this, there's no surprise why fast food is popular. Those are the reasons why it's popular. Right? Uh, so how do we, how do we, how do we, when I say consumers, I'm in it. How do we do a better job, right? I'm a teacher, so for me, it's always education first. We can, as experts, talk about problems with the food systems. And it falls on deaf ears most of the time, if you ask me. We sound like broken records when we talk about this. I can, I can, I can attest to that when I speak to audiences uh, that are not specialized like this one. So... The issues with the food systems have to be framed differently. Differently, The language has to change a little bit. It can't be there's someone standing on a pedestal and saying, this is wrong, this is wrong, do this, do this, do this. It has to change. It has to be inclusive. It has to be an inclusive awareness of the things that are not so good about how we are. It has to be science-based. I'm a scientist. I'm, uh, it has to be science-based. It can be faith-based, but I don't think faith alone can solve the world's problems. Neither can science alone solve the world's problems. And we can get a, a whole philosophical discussion about that. But ultimately, I think it has to start with science. We know, I think we know a lot more about science than we do know about faith, I think. Faith is more relative than science, is the main reason for me. Science is more... Uh, compact. It's more self-contained. Faith is very relative. One person's faith is clearly not another's. But we can agree that science is, if you believe in the axioms of science, that it's more self-contained. So it has to be science-based, ultimately. Uh, the information has to be disseminated more freely. right? So we, I refer to USDA as if, I'm, as if I look... There's probably probably four times in my life that I've gone to the USDA's website for anything, this talk being one of them. <laughs> but, they're, but they are one of the primary sources of that sort of information. Do you think the average person out there is ever going to the USDA's website to look at information? Probably not. So you've got this volume of information that's verifiable, that's out there. But the average person doesn't care about going to sources like that. So where are they going to get this information from? They're just going to have casual conversations in cafes, and they're either going to agree with something or they're going to disagree with something. And life goes on. It perpetuates the way it does. So how do we get this kind of scientific, really good for you information disseminated more generally into the populace without putting them through a whole master's degree in some scientific discipline? How does that happen? You know, are we being elitist about this information? This is only for people who get it. 
the average person, we'll just give you the synopsis. It's just one line. Trust me. Trust me. Science has shown this. Trust me. You need to know this. Do you think that's going to be well received? I don't think so. It hasn't been well received. So we need to find better ways of disseminating this really rich information into the populace. And I'm an educator, but I don't know the answer. I don't know how that happens. The politics of food is for another day, but it exists, as you well know, between lobbyists and agendas and all of that. Po food is as political as any other field. Um, so, and politics is never a fun discussion, if you ask me. Uh, it can be fun, but it never ends well. <laughs> So the politics of food always gets in the way, it seems like. We were, Jennifer, I, I was listening to some of the panel earlier, and I was whispering, we were whispering to each other, saying, if so-and-so heard this, they would be going through the roof by now, because we all know somebody who would disagree with something we thought. And that's the politics of food. It's the, dis, it's the, it's the, the different ways of looking at the same thing. And, uh, you know, in mathematics, I can prove a theorem, and that's the end of that. There is no ifs, ands, and buts. There it is. That's why there are infinitely many primes. That's it. You, you can't tell me there aren't, aren't infinitely many primes. There it is. With topics like food and food advocacy, it's not that clear. It's, food is such a subjective thing. We internalize food like no other thing that we do. We eat because we must and because we like to. And around food is centered really a lot of our existence. It really is. More so than anything else we do. I mean, next to breathing. I mean, we breathe subconsciously, but we eat consciously, hopefully. So when we eat, I mean, we're, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a part of everything we are, right? So how, how has that which has become, that which is a part of everything we are, become such a problem for us? It should be a source of celebration. And it is a lot of the times. But the reason we're having discussions in fora like this is because it's obviously also a huge problem. It's gotten away from us in many ways, in many different directions. It's gotten away from us. So we need to systemically pull them back ever so slightly and make some change and change the energy in the system, if you will, somehow, globally. Starting locally, ending globally. Uh, consumers demand what they demand because they won't eat non-seasonally. You get what you pay for, Bill Thomason says. You get what you pay for. I saw the author and shake his head, no you don't. <laughs> right? You get what you pay for. In his mind, he's simply referring to the fact that in his little farmer's market, you got all these people bringing truckloads of produce that's not grown anywhere around here, and they're selling it for a little bit less, and they're undercutting him, where he's really grow, growing his stuff, you know, 100 different varieties of produce a year, in his little farm, he and his son, and one helper. It's a large farm. And he has to fight for having to sell his really good stuff for, as Marty said, you know, 50 cents extra a pound, or in this case, you know, a melon. But he has to fight for that on a daily basis. And so he's like, you know, you want that crap? You get what you pay for. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying, ultimately. We need a scientific approach to assess how consumers demand what they do. So I think ultimately, you know, we, we put values in any number of things. We go to religious you know, places of worship and peace. Uh, we have principles by which we adhere with the life we live. But we don't have a value system for our food system. We don't have a, a principle of values for our food system. As a country, you know, you can say uh, it's wrong to kill, it's wrong to steal, it's this and that, but you don't say anything about what it's wrong to do when it comes to food. It's so basic, but there is no value system for our food mechanism. That seems to be, those, those conversations need to happen, whether it be in church, whether it be at the dinner table, whether it be in an academic institution, where have you. We need values associated with food. I think we respond good with values as human beings. When something is valuable and near and dear, we think we respond a little bit better. It's personal then, somehow. Uh, so where do I come in for me? You know, I'd like to know, from my perspective, consumers care. My guests care. I don't know how many care. That's the big question. But they care. 
We need to know how many consumers really care about bettering our food system in any number of ways. We think they do because that's what we think. But how many really do? And there are any number of surveys out there, I get that. But beyond that, do we really know how many really care? Care to the point of wanting to make a difference. Not caring like, yes, I care, but I'm still going to go buy a fast food burger tomorrow because that's all the time I have tomorrow to get a lunch. How much do you really care? How many really care and to what degree? Uh, from my point of view, dietary restrictions are an all-time high coming to the restaurant. It's never a problem for me. I can cook food in a, any number of ways, and I have a, a slew of different ingredients in my kitchen that I can access to make any number of diets accessible. So it's not a problem for me, but the average cook and chef out there in a larger restaurant is unable to meet these kinds of restrictions. So there's nefariousness that happens. There's stuff that's passed off as one over as, and as, as, as being something else. It's a matter of trust. You, when you walk into a restaurant, you trust that person in the kitchen who cooked your meal to do the right thing. You're putting it into your body. It doesn't get more personal than that. You're putting food into your body made by somebody else that who you don't even know. There's not even a face associated with this person. It just comes out of this black box. You order something off a sheet of paper and it comes out of this black box, right? And you hope that that stuff that went into you just now is not really going to hurt you. That's an enormous, enormous, enormous amount of trust, you would agree? And that happens a lot in your lifetime. So as chefs, I, I am, I completely welcome that responsibility, and I challenge all chefs out there to welcome the same. I'm not sure they all do. They're usually caught up in their rut. They're dictated by their hierarchies. They have to do a certain way. They don't think about food the, the way you and I might. Right? Yes. So what can you do as an average person? Ask questions. Take control of your ingredients. Right? Support local farmers. All obvious things. Demand better food. Demand better food. And I don't mean stand in front of Capitol Hill and demand better food, but demand better food by the choices you make. Involve the next generation. Cooking can be fun, right? And then you can have very tangible accesses like seafood watches and pocket guides. Everything in moderation, including moderation, they say, right? So very quickly, the carrot experiment. Um, different shades of carrots. Right? We'll put the beets aside. But different shades of carrot. All sourced, you know, from the grocery store to the farm. Bill Thomason's farm. His heirloom carrots and golden beets. With the tops on, everything is edible. It's beautiful. It's not organic. Almost organic, he says. Could be organic. Could be organic, right? Could be organic. We don't know. He didn't go through the certification process. We don't know. This is not bad. 100% carrot juice, boathouse farms. Well, well regarded farm, right? Most, many of you may have tried this. I, I looked very hard for ingredients that were shady. This one doesn't have anything on it. it just says carrots. Publix carrots. Trying to look like these carrots. Chances are they're still pretty good. And then we get into the shady stuff. Sliced carrots, fresh cut, right? Fresh cut, fresh cut. What does that mean, fresh cut? <laughs> of course it was fresh cut. <laughs> but it's labeling, right? Typical peas and carrots, and then the all popular baby carrots, right? Steamed carrots, crinkle cut, crinkle cut. Only carrots so far. Only carrots in all of these things, right? No additives, as far as the labeling goes. No additives. Salt? Not yet. Can. Oh, right. This should be here, then. <laughs> sea salt, but it's sea salt. How much? It's got, it's got minerals in it. How much sea salt? Uh, it's got 300 milligrams of sea salt. It's not too bad, but two containers, two servings, so that's... 600 milligrams. 600 milligrams in here. Uh, it's got calcium chloride to preserve the freshness a little bit. 
because it's freshly cut, it needs to stay fresh in the can. So it's got calcium chlorine and sea salt. Yeah, it needs to stay fresh in the can. Uh, and then this, this mystery product, I don't know. It's diced up and so this thing and some kind of juice. It's carrots on the go. It's a quick snack for lunch. You know, I don't know. Yeah, little, little sorry, small containers. Oh. I'm sorry. That's what, I'll clean it up. So, those servings of carrots, beautifully diced in some kind of liquid. <laughs> Honey glazed carrots. I got one minute, I know. And then, this is the worst. Seasoned, southern style honey carrots. Oh. In a honey and butter flavored sauce. Flavored? <laughs> because, yeah. So, you got different shades of carrot. Most people are going to go in this direction. The average consumer is going to go here. Most of them will go here. Maybe even this one. Very few, if any, will go here. So these beets and carrots cost $6 with the tops on. All of these ingredients cost $15. You get what you pay for. That's what Bill Thomason said. So very quickly to finish this, live a clean life. Care, learn, empower, ask and act, and nurture. I'm going to leave you on that note. You can take some questions if the panelists want to come up. And uh, so for me, the health inspector comes around four times a year to our restaurant. and. Uh, she is primarily interested in sanitation of the space and holding temperatures of ingredients. Beyond that, I am required to only serve, I'm, I'm required to only serve ingredients to the public that have been USDA approved. So if, if, if a guest brings me some chicken that they raised in the backyard or caught some fish on a recreational trip, I cannot serve that to the public. I can serve it only to them with the understanding that they are, you know, if, if it's contaminated, they know that bringing, they, they accept that, that risk bringing it into me. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but as far as ingredients go, raw ingredients, I can only buy USDA approved ingredients. I, I didn't hear the question because of the microphone, but it, were you asking about, about food safety issues in restaurants and Yeah, I mean, I think you're seeing a narrowing of those differences, and certainly with FISMA, I mean, I've been working for years on the Food Safety Modernization Act and, and its effects that will have effects in, in all of agriculture. Um, you know, the, the, we got some exemptions in, in that law as a coalition, you know, looking at uh, farmers that sell direct, this, that, or the other, trying to make sure that it's implemented on a risk-based, you know, one size doesn't fit all. You know, a, a guy like him that buys food, even from, a, a, in my estimation, from a, from a farmer, um, and if there's if there's an issue in in that, he knows. Well, let's see. You had the spaghetti. You had the lamb. You had the vegetarian one, and you had the eggplant. The only common denominator was was the beets or the carrots. You know what? I'm going to tell Bill on Monday that you know what. Of all these people, the only common thing that they ate was this, and they all got sick. There's a problem there. It's the trace back is immediate, versus you know food that is transported nationally, internationally, all around on a different scale. Um, what we're trying to make sure is that the that the scale and implementation of FISMA is truly risk based and scale appropriate.
for him. So if I'm understanding correctly, you're asking me for where I see opportunities for research in genetically engineered crops. Okay. Um, I think that the existing research is still very one-sided, and that has a lot to do with some of the things we talked about, the hijacking of research and the, the influence of private funds into the research. So I think more well-funded research into some of the things that I pointed to, like whether or not there's truly yield, like the risk contamination and the amount of the, the real world impacts of pesticides, we're just starting to see those studies come out. Um, that Those are the ones that I cited to or reference, and I think we can definitely use more because the industry, for every study out there that shows the harm, the industry is pouring money to design a different study that gives you the opposite result. And that's just the unlevel, unfortunately, the unlevel playing field that that in the world that we exist today. So I think definitely there's that. Um, I, I think I'd be interested in seeing research that are more looking at it from a system approach. I think we're seeing a lot of studies that, you know, the study that I mentioned showing that there's no increase, no change in yield, just looks at the yield issue. But it's a system-wide, uh, it's a product that's put in a complicated system. So to the extent that we can have studies that sort of look at it from a system-wide angle, personally, I would very much appreciate that. Can I ask him a question? Yeah. So, uh -huh. you know, the, the concept of, you know, science-based, and I heard you articulate it several times, science-based, science-based, and, and, you know, my question is, who's science? Because, you know, I, de I debated a genetically engineer, the guy at the University of Florida, you know, we were debating genetic engineering, of course, and not of course, but on this night we were, as we have other times as well. Um, and, you know, the you know the word science based came up then as well and and you know if i had known better i would have asked them you know at one point in time science thought let's see the earth was flat uh that the earth revolved around the i mean that the sun revolved around the earth and so and of course you can buy your own science yeah. so if you don't like the research we just hire researchers to do it and so you know who's science and how do you help us clarify that Right, so that's the beauty of my discipline. In mathematics, there is no who's science. It's just science. <laughs> science is science. It's provable. Everything's very verifiable by proof. So clearly in the experimental fields and the physical sciences and the other sciences, life sciences, uh, it can get a little bit more gray. I get that because a lot of the studies are data-driven and, and, and then the methodologies are up, up for some debate and their conclusions are up for some debate. So when I say science-based, I'm referring to, uh, for sure, the scientific method as we've accepted it to start with as a starting point. And then beyond that, all research should be subject to great scrutiny before you accept it you know, un universally. So yes. <laughs> Tobacco industry set the standard in terms of buying science that wasn't really science. Now they've been exposed, but for a long time they had scientists who were saying nicotine's not addictive, um, nicotine, uh, sorry, cigarettes are not harmful to you. So they set the, the gold standard, and now there's people going around trying to set a platinum standard for buying, <coughs> buying scientists. Sure. The question is about the current state of inert uh, ingredients on disclosure and their impacts on, in terms of our analysis and understanding of GE crops. Um, I think Caroline can speak to a lot of uh, where we are in terms of disclosing inerts. Uh, you know, uh, I know that petitions have been filed and you know, there's been push on EPA <coughs> to requiring the disclosure of inerts, but that's, that hasn't happened yet, the EPA is sitting on it. Uh, in terms of its impacts, though, um, you know, th in terms of um, our work in terms of Roundup Ready crops and, you know, the, the pointing to inerts and some known uh, inert ingredients in Roundup that have uh, negative impacts on fish and amphibian species, that's definitely a powerful narrative and speaks to the reason why disclosure and more study of inert ingredients is definitely necessary um, as part of our fight, you know, against GE crops. 
if I disappear for yeah. one second, sure. what I said before about the nurse mm -hmm. destroys any idea of credibility in exactly what you just said. Mm -hmm. There's no possibility you can examine something when you don't know what they're examining. Exactly. And therefore, yeah. it's impact, mm -hmm. it's hidden. Therefore, if you're looking at it for a legal solution, you would be to revise the law, get rid of this stuff. <laughs> very clear. Right. You cannot hide this and then call it something else. So let's convince John Boehner and Mitch McConnell. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll take one more question and then there we're going to go enjoy ourselves. To get ready and energized for tomorrow's. There were two hands at the same time. I'll be fast. I just want to thank you fabulous people for being here. So that's how did I gain access to farms around the world? Um, so I did something different than what most authors do. I hope I'm not too loud in the room, by the way. Um, what I've read in books is authors email the CEO of a company and say, let's meet. And obviously the CEO never replies. Um, I didn't do that even once. I went to the communities and I met people and I made friends with them. And it was um, a friendship as much as it was um, with more investigative purposes. So it was really just getting to know people and then getting introduced to more people and then going out from there without knowing exactly where I would be going or who I would be meeting or what I would be learning. Were you nervous that the farmer would see you or people would question your motives? So I was living with farmers in their houses, like factory farmers, pig factory farmers, chicken, and all kinds of factory farmers. Um, so in Project Animal Farm, their names have been changed. As such, their privacy is not affected because I would not want them to be harmed in any way. Um, they may not have known exactly what I was up to. Even I didn't know that at the end of all of this, I would have a book. It just went organically and it kept going until I thought, I have so much, this is a book. Um, so I've been very careful in terms of the sensitivities involved and doing my best to make sure no one is um, negatively affected by it. Do they know you've written a book? Some of them do, and they're very happy about it. Their names have not been changed. They said, keep my real name, I want to be in there. Um, others do not know about it, no. I'm imagining the audience will be mostly um, urban or suburban audience. Um, and not really that much of a very rural audience. So I'm not sure if they will even hear about it or if they would want to read it. Well, thank you all. Thank you for the panel.